Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's Ross here. Let me just take that off the screen. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, always a privilege to share ideas. Uh, thank you for your precious time. I've got a new book out. Uh, and just in case you don't know who I am, I've been a teacher for many years and I now work with teachers supporting them uh, online and physically all over the world. Um, I am uh, the kind of the process we've got for tonight. Uh, I'm going to introduce to you Patrice Bain in a moment, who is my guest, who's going to uh, guide me through uh, our symposium tonight, which is a fancy word for a good discussion. I don't want to be tied too much by time. Uh, and this is on my YouTube page. So you can watch it later. Uh, but the plan is to go for eight o'clock. I suspect we'll be a little bit later. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. And I'm going to give away lots of book prizes too. Um, I guess before I bring Patrice in, just to kind of explain the, the technology that I'm working on here, um, if you've logged into a platform uh, on LinkedIn or YouTube where this is being broadcast live, if you are logged in, you can leave a comment and I'll see it in the chat box and I can say, I can put your question on the screen uh, and I can use that to pose to me or Patrice on your behalf. So before I... Um, bring Patrice in. This is your chance to have a shout out online, uh, wherever you live, wherever you're watching from, whether it's on a mobile phone in the car, in the school playground or the car park or in your village. Uh, let me know where you're watching from and I shall say hello back and then I'll bring Patrice in and we'll get started. Um, so uh, let's see who we've got. So I can see um, a few people already. The STEM challenge. Hello all the way from the Arab Emirates. Thank you so much. Uh, what are you, two or three hours ahead? So it's almost bedtime for you guys, but thank you very much for joining me. Um, who else we've got? We've got Des here from Guernsey. I've never been to Guernsey, Des. We need to sort that out. I need to come and do some teacher training. Uh, we've got Victoria from Hereford, nice part of the world. Uh, we've got Mr. Gilson here. From Cumbria, I don't know if Patrice, if you know all these areas, we'll test your British knowledge in a moment. Um, and then Bia, she's mentioned that she's got her three-year-old son uh, hoping to go to sleep. So you can watch it recorded, Bia, but um, yeah, I understand the challenges. Um, who else have we got? We've got Kirsty from Bristol. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, again, I've not been to Br um, Bristol for some time before the pandemic, so I need to um, come and visit Bristol soon. I'm going to put uh, Claire at Broughty, Bro Broughty Ferry, and that's I've lost my Scottish accent, but I grew up in Dundee, not too far away from this part of the world. And uh, Isar um, here from Bradford. Uh, so I left London 30 years uh, working as a teacher there. I'm now up in West Yorkshire, so I'm not too far from 
Israel. So nice to join you. Uh, thanks, thanks for thanks for the comment. There's loads of people here. Let's get one more in so I can show you the range and breadth uh, of people. Uh, we've got Nigeria. And uh, what else we've got? Come on, last chance, last chance. Cambridgeshire, Texas. Fantastic. A truly international event. Right. So keep them coming. And if I see anything that pops up in my feed, I'll put them on. I'm going to get to the slides and the content of the book and prizes. There's QR codes of surveys. There's tons of stuff. They say as an artist that your last painting is your best work. So this is my latest book. It's my best work to date. Uh, so the jury's out. Right. I'm going to bring Patrice in. Patrice, um, I encountered Patrice online and discovered her book. Uh, 2019, Patrice, you correct me wrong in a minute, uh, when it was published, Powerful Teaching, it was just a stupendous piece of work alongside Pooja Argoal. Um, she's wonderful. We've kept in touch ever since, and she's kindly um, agreed to compare this event with me and pose, me, pose lots of awkward questions. So, Patrice, can you um, introduce yourself to everybody and uh, let everyone know a little bit about what you do? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I'm in Missouri, United States right now, and I'm a teacher. And a, a little bit of background. I've been teaching for a very long time. And I had some questions such as most of my students did really well in my class, but why? Or if some of my students didn't do well, why? And there was no place for me to find this information. Most information on how people learned was done at universities with college students in laboratories. And in 2006, Drs. Henry Rodiger and Dr. Mark McDaniel wrote a large grant here in the United States to study how did children learn in an authentic classroom? And that classroom that was chosen was mine. So uh, it was the first in the United States in 2006. We've talked about memory for thousands of years, but the latest research with children in classrooms didn't start until 2006. And then along came Dr. Pooja Agarwal, who worked with me every day. And we investigated how we learn and I developed strategies based upon that. And in 2019, as Ross said, uh, we published Powerful Teaching, it's plugging book. my book a little bit right here. Yeah, a fantastic book. <laughs> Unleash the Science of Learning. And then last year, um, because so many teachers, as I go around and, and do uh, professional development, teacher said, how can we get this information to parents? So I wrote a parent's guide. But Ross takes this a step further. So my book, Powerful Teaching, Unleash the Science of Learning, I feel like Ross's book could say, Unleash the Science of Memory. Because too often, we are just not taught this information. And the way Ross has this book, it, it is the outline of it is wonderful. He starts each chapter with an explainer. What is it we're talking about? And then next he goes into practical ideas and then worked examples. And then finally a template, even with QR codes. It is right there for us. Um, but there's one more thing I want to say, because I, I love this part, too. We're now learning about the science of learning, but still missing are some of the keys about memory. And there's a quote in Ross's introduction that I wanted to mention. Uh, the quote is by Tricia Taylor, and it's a wardrobe metaphor. And I like it because the quote is actually by Dr. Henry Rodiger, who started the research in my classroom. But it compares memory to a wardrobe. And here it is. Memories are objects stored in that space. And retrieving a memory 
is akin to searching for and finding an object in that physical space. What Ross does in this book is he not only explains how our brain is and where memories are, but he shows us how to get there. He shows us how to open the drawers of that wardrobe, open the doors and help teachers, help all of us understand when we learn something, where does it go? Where does it stay? And how can we retrieve it? So that's my intro, Ross. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I, I like. I want to just listen to you. <laughs> I, I find um, the reason I ask everyone, Patrice, to join me is because you'll see she's full of wisdom. She's so memorizing. She's <laughs> lovely to talk with. Um, so it's just going to be a chat. And the way you can take part in our chat, just to remind everyone watching, is leave a comment. So log in to your channel, leave a comment, and I'll display it online. And then we'll use that to respond to you. The, the plan is um, to go through the book, uh, not in too much depth because we'll be here forever, um, but we'll go through the kind of key highlights. And Patrice is going to kind of pose questions uh, a bit ad hoc. We've also got some planned questions and a few QR codes along the way. Just so you know, on my side, I'm managing all the chat box, the slides, the technology, uh, and Patrice has thrown some hard questions at me. <laughs> so my working memory is going to be through the roof, but I'm going to do do my best. So, um, and as ever, you can watch this later. So don't feel that like you need to stay all night, but hopefully you can get all the best bits as part of the live session and also win a prize. Uh, <laughs> so you can see I've prepared my uh, book display uh, here. And I've got a good 50 copies on the side lurking. So we'll see how many we give away. It depends on how nice all of you are and how how much you participate. So we're going to just uh, kind of kick off stuff. Uh, Patrice is going to ask me a question to start, middle and end of each chapter, and I'm going to take you through take you through the book. So Patrice, do you want to kick off with the first one or shall I just crack on? I will. So Ross, why did you write this book? Oh... Uh, well, that's the most important question, I suppose. Um, I, I think ultimately, you know, I've always had a fascination with psychology. I've never had a formal degree in that area, but I have found myself covering for a psychology teacher teaching 18-year-olds for their exam. Uh, and, I, and my best friend, my best man was actually a psychologist. So I've always been part of psychological conversations then my life as a blogger from 2007, putting out an idea on social media, someone cr critiquing it, sending you feedback, show me the evidence, why do you think so? I guess that rabbit hole of social media and access to research and ideas spreading very quickly and rapidly, you soon get into this wormhole of ideas and, and find yourself writing, blogging. And the more you write and blog, the, the more cathartic it is, the more deeper you get into it. Um, lots of areas. And I guess, you know, my website, as people will know, you know, 17 million readers, the analytical data has allowed me to see what resonates with teachers. And also my doctoral research is looking at social networks. So I'll pull out a string of tweets from Twitter and see what teachers are discussing and correlate it with my website and my physical training. And I guess the last 10 years, and particularly the last five, there's been a massive explosion about education research cognitive science and teachers just super it's not there yet for everybody but some are very very excited including myself about this new uh, access for teachers not it's not a new field of research although the neuroscience is relatively new but um it's just great for teachers to access and then find some practical recommendations is the biggest challenge so i guess the book was me putting what i think was a distinct lack of training when I trained to be a teacher in the early 90s that I could have benefited from earlier on. And I wanted to write that book that I could give to everybody. I say, here it is. Now that's part of your journey. What are you going to do next? And I think that that's it. So it's kind of everything and anything into, into a, a, a book. Um, everyone goes on that kind of journey about why we, why we remember, why we forget. So I just wanted to put it in a place, really, and just use some of my insights and experience to put it into some practical techniques. 
Great. Well, let me ask another question, Ross. <clears throat> so, okay, here the brain and memory, and this can this can be sometimes a little intimidating when we don't have a lot of that background. How complex do you think this topic is? Oh gosh, that is a well. It, it's very complicated. I mean, it, it as you'll know, it takes years to even get close to master in the classroom and you know that art of teaching as well as the science of teaching i think for much of my career i i rested on the art of teaching and slowly the science and the research is starting to really refine my approaches i guess the new teachers i work with they're they're being immersed with this much sooner the challenge they face is they need to then go in and put it in practice and live that art side of their teaching experience and connect the dots, I suppose, which is why I love Trish Taylor's book, Connect the Dots. Um, it's an incredibly complex topic. You know, we're not cognitive neuroscientists. We're not cognitive psychologists. We're teachers who have a small interest in this area. And I think we're all fascinated with how we teach and the best ways to do it. And we've got a good understanding of study techniques and how students should learn. But I think just taking it a little step deeper, here's the brain. Here's how we can support or hinder the learning process. This is what happens to our neurons and our memory when we get more sleep or less sleep or eat poorly or eat back, you know, eat well, etc. And I think all these things really do uh, strengthen our professional development and will, I believe, change the way you teach. Um, you know, I'm not in the classroom full time anymore, but if I was, I would total, I would be an entirely different teacher without question. So I guess, you know, the position I am in, in now, I can share that knowledge with a wide, much wider range of professionals around the world using my platform so that that impact can spread and people can use the ideas uh, beyond me and, and maybe uh, kind of go quick. It's taken me 30 years, so hopefully this book will help people go quicker. And and just to add to that, Ross, even though it really is complex, you've made the information really accessible. So you take what's complex and make it so we can all understand it. And I really appreciate that in your book. Let me follow up with another one. So getting this information what difference do you think this might make to teachers, students, parents? Uh, well, I, I think just to reiterate that last point, it, it will change the way, it will influence the way that you teach. Absolutely. For parents, particularly if we think about, you know, our, our socioeconomic status, the disadvantaged context, if these messages could be spread to school leaders and college leaders in particular, where they can then work a bit, uh, refine their processes to reach hard to reach parents. And I, I guess, you know, more strategically policymakers and how governments can raise the agenda of sleep, diet, exercise. We know it's all important, but it's not really part of, at least here in England, a robust education policy process you know we, we talk about lunchtime and break time here in england over the last 10 years that time has reduced mm -hmm. now i know why if you give kids more time to play around on the playing with all the friends uh, uh, unsupervised they're gonna you know and particularly challenging schools they're gonna start having a fight so you need to reduce that time and get them back into class but what the research is clear they we all benefit from regular breaks exercise etc so how can we use this information to change the way we teach or redesign our curriculum and our lunches and breaks. Uh, again, context is key, different types of schools, different age groups, all that matters. I guess my experience in a high school talking more about the older students in our society, how do we change it at that level, even alongside, I guess, the, the kind of importance of exams, but the importance of the study skills for life mm -hmm. that will give all children kind of long-term success and problem-solving skills and looking after themselves rather than, you know, some of the things that we're all familiar with. Um, 
I'm conscious I'm going to put some slides on. And I've got loads of comments coming through, so I'm going to try and manage it all, Patrice. But if, maybe if I put the slide up, let's see how we get on here. Um, that first slide I've got uh, coming up, folks, and keep your questions coming through, is I guess just the kind of what, why, how journey of some of the things that I've alluded to already. Um, I guess ultimately in the back end of the book, and I'll explain this for Chapter 10 as we go through, is there's a, uh, you know, using all my wisdom with teacher training, you know, in my own life as a school leader and now doing it full time professionally, is here's how you can do it back in your school with the resources and use everything that I know to design your own highly effective teacher training session. Um, if I just go through the book and just some of the kind of introductory parts, there's 10 chapters in the book. So the first one is let's look at the brain. And I found this really challenging, uh, really interesting. And I kept asking myself, how, what, how much of this do I need to know? And how would it make me a more effective teacher? It was the question I kept asking myself. So maybe we can come um, back to that question, Patrice, at some point. Um, chapter two is how memory is shaped. So what happens anatomically in the brain when we develop our knowledge uh, or we learn to walk or we can remember two plus two equals. Then we look at the types. So I want to spend a little bit of time uh, just explaining this to you. Some of you that follow me will have seen my little beginner's guide to memory. But chapter one and two, I'm going to show you the resources. But in the rest of the chapters, you're going to have to get the book, I'm afraid. Um, number four, learning's emotional. I demonstrate this in my physical training all the time with adults, with professional teachers. And I demonstrate how learning can be hindered when we heighten the, the stress or the scenarios uh, or the consequences. So we talk about rewards and sanctions in school in particular. Cognitive load theory, a term that's quite familiar with a few teachers here in England now. Why? Because it's part of government policy and language, which is good. Um, so again, it's you know not necessarily tick boxing, but what does the research say? How will it make as a better teacher? Then some mental models, you know, what, how do you remember the colours of the rainbow? What's happening there? And how do does that support retention? Then I've looked at neurons and brain plasticity. So I guess from this point, you know, what happens when we drink a, a glass of wine? Did you know that you're deliberately choosing to kill your neurons? Um, and how we restore neurons after an accident, uh, you know, when we talk about diseases and brain damage and things like that. And that, again, that's a complex field and that's way beyond my level of expertise. Another term, cognitive apprenticeship, another new uh, piece of research from the early 90s. Uh, it's looking at moving away from what we do traditionally as teachers to more of a cognitive approach. Then number nine, chapter nine. So looking at well-being, so sleep, diet, exercise, we know what the research says. I guess I'm just highlighting some recent research and posing the question, how can we make this more of a policy decision at government level and change the way we do things in school? Yes, exams, but what about all these other things as part of an explicit curriculum rather than what we call a hidden curriculum, things that are taught behind the scenes, I suppose. And then the last chapter, as I've already alluded to, how you take all this back into your own place of work or you professionally on, as, as an individual and do this for yourself and share the information. Uh, Patrice has already explained the book method. Um, so there's 10 chapters, 156 pages if you're interested. It's about 25,000 words. Um, 105 references. I've started a little database and I want you to be part of it. My bold plan is to have one of the largest databases in England for teachers at being surveyed on work in memory. So I'll show you what I've got so far. Um, and then there's the, the, the kind of process. So what do you need to know or what have I found out? Here's an idea. How would I do it in my classroom and then you try it. And that's how the book is laid out chapter by chapter. So let me show you the data. Then I'll pause on the survey and I'll take a couple more questions from people watching as well as from Patrice. Um, so here's a first bit of data. Um, so there's all the kind of age, experience, ethnicity, etc. So I'll share that another day. Um, but so far I've got 
Uh, the survey shows 40, but there's about 100 responses now. I only published it last night. My aim is to get 1,000 teachers responding in the next couple of months. But you can see here this large blue bar suggests that um, in terms of teacher training when you qualified or the training you currently have, this is the biggest weakness. What is cognitive apprenticeship? Does it matter? Will it make a difference? So that was the greatest. Then we've also got here sharing ideas on cognition in-house between one another in our day-to-day -day work or in professional development. So those are, are the bits of information that people are telling me. This question here is the confidence. What confidence do you have as a teacher in the, these areas of the book? So the questions are aligned to the book. So you'll see straight away cognitive apprenticeship features again. So it could just be people don't know what it is. Uh, I think once I explain it, it should become clear. And we might start to see if I survey people again in the future. Uh, we'll see how this data changes. I guess if we pick out a strength, we could argue and I, 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 the most of the information's come from the UK so far, cognitive load theory as a policy uh, phrase used in documentation, more and more teachers are familiar with, with what it is. I guess the challenge is how does it change the way you teach? Uh, and I'm very conscious knowing what I know now doing this online session. We're 20, 25 minutes in. We all need to pause for a break. So I'll do that in a moment. The last bit of data is this one. So what are the challenges of bringing it all to life? No surprise, time and the costs. So this free webinar, you've got a book. Um, if you take part in the survey, I'll give you half the price of the book back. So I don't think many authors do that. So I'm going to show you a QR code in a moment that you can scan uh, on the screen. It'll take you to the survey link. There's about five, 10 questions that'll take you five minutes or so. And then you can be part of the largest database, I hope, uh, that I can build and, and share this data and give it to you so you can use it back in your workplace. But that's an interesting chart there also with the current challenges. So my gut suggests that if this is what it looks like already, I, su I suspect in you know uh, a couple of months time, the data will probably be very similar. So I don't expect too many changes. Um, so here's the QR code, and that's the blog I put out um, last night. I'm just going to move a few things on my screen here so I can um, see a few comments. So on your on your phones, if you've got a double device on your side, if you're watching on a desktop, you can use your QR code. I'm just going to turn this banner off so you can see the QR code properly. So take part. So I'm going to pour some water, Patrice, and you can give me some thoughts. Um or a question, and I'm just going to skim the chat box also and see what everyone else has to say. I think these are wonderful questions, and um, this is going to be a really important study. You know, when in our teacher preparation programs, will more of this be taught? Um, will more CPD involve? this information this is valuable it is i'm just going to skim a few comments here patrice so if i just um i shall switch the screen off for a moment um lots of questions so what i'm going to do folks i'm going to star a few of these questions and come back to them at the end but you know thank you for everyone saying where you're watching from I've never been to Greece, Anastasia. I need to sort that out, don't I? Whether it's for a holiday or to come and work in your school. Um, but yeah, thanks for taking part. There's loads of great questions such as this one, the biggest impacts on the effectiveness of memory. So thank you, Victoria. I'll star that and I'll come back to it later. Um, so uh, I'm going to go into chapter one and two in greater detail. And then the plan is, and I told you it wouldn't be done by eight o'clock, we're going to skip <laughs> the rest of the chapters. I'm going to just show you what's in them. And then we'll have a discussion at the end um, with you guys taking part online, as well as Patrice firing me some difficult questions. So um, let's get back to the screen. So here we go. So there's the QR code, folks. Scan this. Take part in the survey. On completion, you'll get a voucher code on my website. Uh, you'll grab half the book 
book for half the price, my publishers would be outraged. Um, <laughs> and then what I'll do is I'll sign a copy to you personally. And I'm living in Yorkshire now. There's a very steep hill to the post office, and it's quite tiring to walk up the top. But I will do it just for you if you want an assigned copy. Anyway, that's enough of the book plug. So the first chapter is the brain. And I said to Patrice before we came online, this is still not yet embedded knowledge for me. So I have already, um, let me just pop back a slide there. I've missed the, missed the slide. Um, I, this is not yet embedded fully enough for me. And I need to revisit the, the material many, many times for it to be embedded. Um, but I'm getting there. So this is very much... I would say for a teacher, kind of intermediate advanced knowledge for psychologist teachers, this should be pretty much part of your teacher training. So following the method of what's in the book, explain, here's an idea, here's what how I would do it with a worked example, and then here you have a go. That's the process throughout the whole book. So this chapter in particular is about the anatomy and the physiology of the brain. Why? Because if we understand a little bit more about its components, it will tell us a bit more about how we can look after our brain, what happens when we are learning, and how we can do certain things at policy level as well as classroom level and at home to uh, work alongside our young people. So what I did... Um, I guess bringing together some of the things I've been reading as part of my blogger life, but also exclusively researching on memory. And, you know, lockdown, I guess one advantage, dare I say, of lockdown for me was, um, you know, lots of, you know, particularly on the strict lockdown at home, regular day walks, audible books, listening to lots and lots of research on memory. So I brought everything together about what I've been reading and listening to. So, um, let me kind of just start with this. I'm going to be quizzing you on this later, everyone, so you need to be paying attention here. Um, there's, there's two fields. I guess the other one is the neuropsychology, but the, I guess the neuroscience is the relationship between the, the cognition. So remember, cognition is your thinking, and then the functions and how that kind of uh, connects. So the biological functions and the mental processes. The psychological aspect is how the mind operates, so how we acquire knowledge. Uh, and I guess as teachers, we're kind of, you know, for, uh, for, for me, I've been very much interested in the, the bottom half. What I've been, uh, you know, working alongside Patrice and accessing blogs is getting really interested in the top. Uh, and I've been trying to get into a little bit more, and obviously it's blended into a bit of the anatomy. And I keep asking myself this question, if I know more about the brain, how does it change what I know currently or how I might teach? So I can come back to that question. So um, what I say at the beginning of the book is the ideas in this book aren't new. So there's one way to kind of put people off wanting to read it. Um, why? Because people have been talking about memory since, you know, Egyptian times, even probably, I mean, that's the first written record. And I've actually got one of my first quotes here that I just want to, forgive me, please read out. Um, and humans ought to know that from nothing else but from the brain come joy, delight, laughter and sport, sorrow, grief, despondency and lamentations. And by this in a special manner, we acquire wisdom and knowledge and see and hear and know what are foul and fair, what are bad and what are good. And by the same organ, we become mad and delirious and our fears and terrors are sailors and all these things we endure by the brain. And this is from uh, a quote from Hippocrates, who uh, this is the kind of time when he lived. Um, and it kind of highlighted me. I, I've just started my journey, really, and kind of recorded it. Um, but I'm not the first person to do it, and I won't be the last. And I guess for people participating here, this this whole process, just being part of this webinar, reading the book, reading my materials, that's part of your journey. The question for me is, what are you going to do next and how are you going to share it? So um, I'll pause for a break in a moment, but let me just take it a little bit further. So I've looked at, you know, the kind of key components, the kind of um, parts of the brain, the top, the bottom, left and right. So I've learned all these words, how to spell them, what they mean. And I was saying to Bruce earlier, I need to keep quizzing myself on this 
to make it memorable. The five regions, so all these complicated words, you know, what does cephalon mean? Mesen, Dian, Teller, Meten, Mylene. Uh, really, really interesting stuff. And then just breaking the brain down a little bit further into, well, what part of the brain helps us to hear? What part of the brain helps us to make judgments? So that's the frontal lobe. And when I ever receive critique from a troll online in particular, I've soon discovered that when we develop empathy, it's actually a part of the brain that we can nurture and grow. And it's not so much in other people, particularly people who can't empathize with another person's view. So I often think that that might be the kind of trolls of the world or our bullies in the world that don't necessarily have that part of the brain as developed as ours. So uh, there's something for you to take away. Um, so the practical idea in this book, I've attached a teaching idea alongside each chapter. The one I've chosen here is direct instruction, so, you know, and how we can be more concrete in our discussions or our questions with pupils, how we can be more explicit, how we can be more mindful about what we say, when we say it, how, and so on and so forth. And then the idea or the worked example I've given you is if we were in a classroom, so I might give you this worksheet and I might say, well, here are the parts of a volcano. Could you write a paragraph to describe all the key pe features or the parts or whatever the explicit instruction would be? And I'm not demonstrating that here. And this is a good example of the, the kind of uh, cognitive science technique, dual coding. I've given you an image and I'm asking you now to write a text. That's on the premise that you already know some information and you can recall it as part of a retrieval exercise. What's interesting, even when I share this with adults, is if I now flip it, and let's say in the classroom, instead of me giving you the picture, I give you instead the paragraph with the keywords written in red, and I give you a blank diagram, and I ask you to label the diagram it's really interesting. So comments in the chat box. Most people find this process a bit easier. So I guess because we're seeing this for the first time, and we all know what a volcano is, but we might have forgotten some of the words. So this is where we get into memory. Um, we can start to see, I suppose, what technique has more benefits and how far will it take us to do the first example where we see the picture with the words labeled, and then we can actually recall the whole paragraph and write it down ourselves. For the first time. So there's one technique. Inside the book, uh, you've got, so there's, there's the two examples there. So inside the book, you've got me kind of explaining this uh, in an abstract fashion, just with text, using the dual technique example there as example two. There's another example here, example one, where you've got the instructions of how to build a table. And I don't know if you have... Um, Outside England, I'm sure most people might have an Ikea store or Walmart or something like that, where you get a table and a set of instructions, and those universal instructions have no text. They are universal drawings so that anyone can build the table. So it's kind of looking at how we might do this in the classroom, being clear and precise, direct instruction, concrete information rather than abstract concepts. So in the book, there's a QR code, so you can scan this one, grab the template. Obviously, in the book, there's a lot more detail around the book, but this QR code, everybody will take you to this particular template if you want that one. So that's chapter one, Patrice. Excellent. And, and what I really like is having the access to that information. We may not, you know, memorize every aspect, but it helps us become familiar. And then with your book, when we have questions, we can go back. It's right there for us. So I really like chapter one and the clarity it gives us. Thank you, Patrice. Um... Hello, John. I know John. I've worked with John in his school in Spain. So hi, John. Thank you for joining me. Um, nice to see some friends. Um, okay, 
chapter two. So taking it a bit further. So we've done a bit of history of the brain and, you know, what millions of people have done before us. Um, so I thought, right, let me unpick a bit of anatomy and what happens when we can suddenly, so I'm waving my hands and I'm talking and I'm using all this technology. So there's a lot of memory storage that's happened already for me to be in this position where I can respond to questions from Patrice and use the technology. So I've unpicked all this. So here's some here's some facts, I suppose. Um, did you know we have 86 billion neurons, which is just ridiculous? Um, and they can form up to one trillion connections, which I think is unfathomable. So if we want to kind of break this down, um, and I believe 50 billion, in fact, give or take one or two, are in the, the center of your brain in that core part. But if you count to one million seconds, it will take you 11 and a half days, not that you'd want to. But imagine doing it for 80, 86 billion. So just to count to one billion would take you 31 years. Now, we don't have time to do that, but that shows you. And uh, I'll have to double check. Uh, the book's data, but I, I think it's about 1 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy or something crazy like that. So you can kind of see the depth and breadth of the neurons that are available to us in our brain are just mind-blowing. Uh, and I guess it go, for me, when I started to unpick this, I thought, well, you know, I'm 48. I can still learn a language. I can still learn the piano. I just need to put in that hard work, build those connections, repeat, repeat, repeat to a point where it's automatic. And that's how learning happens. Uh, and I guess we just need to make time to do these types of things. So can you still learn a language when you're 89 years old? My answer is yes, you can. Um, so I think it's a good message for us all in terms of just the facts about our neurons. I, I wanted to know, I guess, from, from this part of the book, what happens in the brain physically and how. And again, not being an expert, just wanting to unpick this. And then thinking, right, back to the teacher, how can I shape memory in the classroom knowing that that's what goes on? So we do this as teachers, but I just wanted to kind of get a bit more detail. So without getting too bogged down, everybody, um, and I need to turn that off. I haven't checked those uh, PowerPoint um, little animations. But here is a neuron, give or take, um, give or take the graphic. But you know, just unpicking some of the terminology here. And I, I'm i thinking very carefully because at the moment I'm just designing the teacher training materials and I've got to think, right, if I stand in front of a room of teachers and do this, I, I, I think the jury's out on how, how useful it might or might not be. So I'm going to have to work really hard in terms of takeaways for teachers. But it help, it'll have a purpose in some shape or form, I'm confident. But there is a single neuron and then I thought, well, let me just dig a bit deeper and what happens when it connects. So you've got that connection right in the middle and that's that neuroplasticity. So when the, the, the dendrites connect to the synapsis and form that memory. Um, and again, I could go into this in greater detail, but probably not for this short session. Um, the practical idea in this part is retrieval practice. So I, I'm great. I'd like to be joined by Patrice, who is the guru uh, <laughs> on this and got a wonderful book. So that if you've not read Patrice's book, everyone, I'd strongly recommend it. There's some brilliant stuff in there. But the retrieval practice, I guess, to emphasize and, and Patrice will back me up. It's it's a learning strategy, not an assessment strategy. So, you know, assigning grades and all those types of things and high stakes scenario, that's quite the opposite in terms of what the research recommends. And I know uh, Patrice's good friend Pooj has done a huge database on all the retrieval practice research. And you have to work quite hard to find classroom research studies on this topic, but it is getting shared and it is being uh, access, accessible to teachers more and more. And I think more people that are familiar with this now are starting to see the benefits. So uh, just for this last book, rather than share the templates, I want to do a quiz because it's retrieval practice. So on your phones, everybody, and I'm going to come out the slides to make this work. I'm going to try a quiz using this QR code. So if you can scan this QR code for me, please. Um, and I will put the 
chat. Uh, I'm going to put the link in the chat box because as soon as I move away, I'm sure someone will say, what was the link? So here is my code. Here it comes. So P O L L ev.com forward slash teacher toolkit or scan the QR code. I just need to come out the slides and activate the actual quiz. So I'm going to test you on what we've done so far to hopefully embed your knowledge. So fingers crossed that works. If you've not got connected, um, there you go. The link is on the screen. So pollev.com forward slash teacher toolkit. Apparently, uh, if I do it right and I don't break it, uh, you'll be assigned a name and you'll go up and down the leaderboard. You've got 10 seconds to ask, answer it, nine questions. And then whoever's at the top of the leaderboard, first prize giveaway. So this is what people have come for. The rest of the book we're going to skim through and Patricia and I are going to have a chat. And I'm just going to rather than be tight at the slide, just dipping in and out of them. So uh, here we go. I'm going to break this, Patrice. Let's see what happens. <laughs> so here's the first question, everybody. How many chapters are there in the book? So there is your eight seconds or so to respond. I guess it will automatically time out. So 29 results. Thank you for people participating. Okay. And then I can show you the correct answer. Well, it's like being in class, isn't it? <laughs> um, so 10. Now, I believe, Patrice, the research on retrieval is, uh, or multiple choice quizzes is make the options hard, not too easy. So if I, put <laughs> a thousand, if I put a thousand chapters, it's too easy to eliminate. So you can see here one or two people got the answer wrong. So let's see who's in the lead. So if you've got, in fact, there's lots of people all joint first place. So let's see nine, nine, chap uh, nine questions later. All right. What chapter is cognitive load theory? So I showed you all 10 chapters at the start. You've likely have forgotten, unless, I don't know, Darren Leslie or Sarah watching, you've got a copy of the book to hand, hopefully. You can have a quick sneak peek through the book and find what chapter it is. So what chapter? Three, six, five, or eight? 10 seconds. Okay, time up. Okay, correct answer is chapter five. Okay, so let's see our leaderboards. Okay, we're still, oh, we've got four or five people in tied positions. So let's see, let's, let's move on. The research, so I showed you where teachers lacked confidence the most. Which, which area of the book was it the most? We need, we need some kind of quiz music here, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> okay, 10 seconds. So the correct answer was cognitive apprenticeship. So well done, 81%. Let's have a look at the leaderboards. Okay, so we've got guest 1395. Can we have a woohoo, that's me in the chat? <laughs> Let's see who it is. Identify yourself. Okay, next question. What do teachers say is the biggest challenge? Okay. So this is a hard one. So I, I want to make the multiple choice hard. That's what the research recommends. Okay, I think we've got a woohoo from the STEM challenge. Okay, so correct idea was the cost for training. That's what the data says at the moment. So only 7%. So let's see who's top of the leaderboard. Is it still STEM challenge? I think it is. I think it is. What is cognitive neuroscience? So I skip these definitions really quickly. Uh, there's your choices. Okay, one more second. Okay, let's show your answers. So there's your choices. 56% the relationship between thinking and function. Okay, leaderboards. 195, 1395 still ahead. I think they might have it in the bag. Let's see. What date is one of the earliest references to the brain? So I showed you a couple of things on a graphic and I read a quote. Here's your choices. I've made them desirably difficult is the phrase, isn't it? Rather than too easy. Two seconds left. Let's see. 
So there we go. 1700 BC, the first written record, Egyptians. So 1395, still in the lead, 8716, close behind. There's not many questions left. What part of the brain is the root of our mind? Now, um, I talked about the front of the brain. I wonder if you can remember the part or the label of the diagram. Again, I skipped through this really quickly. Okay. So the correct answer is telencephalon, the front of your brain. Uh, let's see, 1395, still ahead. I think they got it in the bag. Okay, next question, frontal lobe, what's it responsible for? Balance, touch, judgment, or vision. Okay. Correct answer is judgment. Well done, 80%. Let's check that leaderboard. Okay. Okay. How many neurons does the adult brain give or take one or two, depending on how much wine you drink? Where are we? What are you going with here, Patrice? What are you going with? <laughs> okay, correct answer, 86 billion, 33%. Well done. And I think guess 1395 has won because the little ticker tape exploded. So there we go. So who's 1395? Everyone's going to say it's me. So I'm going to double check. <laughs> I'm going to double check the scores after we finish and see who who the person is. But um, if you can email me, I'm assuming it's the Woo um, the uh, STEM challenge. Let's see. Uh, unless you just were excited that you got one answer correct. So um, please get in touch if that's you. Guest one three nine five, and I will ping you a question. Uh, ping you over a copy of the book uh, and walk up that steep hill. Um, so Patrice, I'll just pause there. Yeah, I have a question for you, Ross, a question slash statement. So what you showed us for chapter two is really pretty technical yes. about, you know, the neurons and everything. But you have this great analogy in there that um, a pathway through a forest is real similar to learning. So yeah. taking from the real technical aspect to something we can relate to, how would you describe that? Well, it goes back to that wardrobe metaphor, because we love metaphors, but we should also maybe not be too constrained by them, I suppose, when we get into the world of the brain and memory, because they can also, when you get deeper, they can limit you, and then you end up being given the wrong details, I suppose. But I guess keeping it simple as a beginner's guide to at least get interested and get in love with this area um, I suppose we we got you know we go up to the hills of Yorkshire where we are and we go off the path and we walk through a meadow and all the flowers are above our knees. There's no trodden path. So if we create a path and follow it the next day, eventually the grass will be flattened and it will turn into a well-trodden path. So I guess that's the analogy in terms of how a memory is shaped. Um, I've got. Um, my, my son can play the trumpet. We've got a piano at home. He hasn't had piano lessons, but just simply by putting the letters of the, the, the C scale on the keys, he's transferred his knowledge of the trumpet and he can play a tune on the piano. He's had no formal lessons yet. We'd, we'd like to do that in the future. But you can see how that established path on a kind of new territory um, where you develop schema can be transferred to another context. So it's pretty much the, you know, the wardrobe analogy, the kind of walking through a forest metaphor where there's no path and you create one, and then it slowly becomes an embedded track that you can for follow uh, for a trail. Uh, I guess these metaphors help us understand these complex terms and how we can you know, access this complicated field, but also uh, understand it better and translate it into practical ideas for the classroom. Thanks. Great. So um, let me pop this back up. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm going to just kind of skim the last three chapters, and I won't do any of it justice, but I think um, 
I'm just going to move that banner. Chapter three goes into types of memory. So I do this in my beginner's guide on my website and I explain the differences between short, working and long term. And you've got a kind of brief uh, description underneath the titles. What I've learned with working, all the research I've read generally, and again, what the research is studying, I suppose, is worth unpicking also. But within the book and the references I've mentioned, they generally say three to nine pieces of information we can manipulate at once. So assuming everyone watching has established knowledge and is contributing to society and as an adult, etc., I'm assuming you'll know the first planet in the solar system, two plus two, and the colors of the rainbow. There's three questions in a row fired at you unannounced, which isn't helpful for assessment. I need to warn you the questions are going to come. And I ask you for the answer straight back. Um, if I then go up to nine questions, I can exacerbate your working memory. I'm either quizzing you on things you know or things that you don't know. And, I, and as a teacher, I make that choice to support or hinder that process. If I ask you what corpus linguistics is, if you have no pre-knowledge, then I'm really pushing your work in memory. And we're kind of focused in on the red and the yellow areas rather than your established schema already embedded. So I guess this slide, I, I, I've been looking at this for three or four years now. And in the classrooms, what we're, we're teaching children is concepts, rules, and facts, re repetition, developing curriculum knowledge. And through retrieval, you know, that information, what are the colors of the rainbow? It's stored. When we quiz, we retrieve. Uh, Patrice's wonderful book, Write It or Say It, the best, research, uh, best recommendation I can give you for retrieval. You pull it out of children's heads, and that helps that retention of knowledge. I guess the decorative and the procedure was just the differences between the knowledge and then that problem solving type or the critical thinking where you're selecting the right skill to solve that, that task. I can go into this in a lot more detail, uh, but not for now. Um, so there's just some questions, examples there. The book also talks about, I guess, in the curriculum sense, developing schema. So knowing a little bit more about environment, home and classroom, different types of memory eidetic sensory memory so your senses as well as the three i've just explained how we pay attention how we get attention in the classroom to then add knowledge knowing more about working memory it's limited we switch off we get distracted i talk about the weather i ruin the whole process and then in the classroom how we do this and this is inspired by some of your work patrice that near to far transfer is the green boxes are, I suppose, what teachers do in each of those stages between encode, store, and retrieve, and how you move that knowledge from near to far. And, and kind of building on that to think of the perfect schema work or how we might look at a curriculum design and how we might introduce space practice, or in America or elsewhere, we call it distributed practice, and how we might interleave topics. So my favorite definition for interleave practice is fruit salad. Apples, pears, bananas, oranges, all mixed together, but not the baked beans. Although it's a category of food, it's a dissimilar type of food. So we'd put that elsewhere. And I guess it's a good approach for interleaving different aspects or similar categories of your curriculum over the kind of key stage or academic year. So that's chapter three. I'll do one more chapter um, Patrice, and I'll pose for some questions for chapter three and four, if that's okay. Um, I've always believed learning's emotional, and uh, I guess in the classroom, how we can reward students to motivate them to attempt a difficult piece of work or to be to get that feedback when they've done really well, but they might rest on the laurels and not put much effort in. So how do you balance that? I guess also just, you know, and this isn't written exclusively in the book, but I've been working quite a lot on the reward loop in terms of feedback, where teachers will traditionally say feedback or marking. And, and this is kind of a bit of outdated language now. And we need to try and reform the marking burden that teachers face. So I'm a big fan of verbal signals uh, or verbal scripts and non-verbal signals in the classroom. And then looking at Hattie and Timperley's research, 
on feedback, feed up and feed forward and what the differences are. I guess feedback, I can only give you feedback if I can compare it to what you did before. If it's a new piece of work, I can only give you feed up or feed forward. So what are they? And again, what do they look like in the classroom? So I'm currently on these nine different variations of marking. But I don't say the word mark and I say these different phrases. And on my site, you'll see me model all these different examples. And I think it hopefully will support many schools moving away from marking and feedback policies towards a more balanced way of providing feedback and reward for students in class and that burden of having to evidence writing things down to a better place where we can think about emotions in terms of feedback and how it supports retention of knowledge and develops it and so on and so forth. The idea in this chapter is rereading and saying it out aloud. So at the bottom there, I've given you a picture, dual coding of Hippocrates and the quote, which is attributed to him. And if we did this as a training session, I'd probably get you to read it or say it out aloud. And then we'd unpick the research on rereading. So, um, I'll pause there for another glass of water and Patrice will pose a couple of questions to me. Well, let me start um, one from chapter three that I thought was really interesting. So I wrote this question down. In chapter three, you discuss context dependent memory, which refers to the improved memory performance that is present when individuals are tested in the same context yes. in which they learn the material. So that's really interesting. Let me just, when individuals are tested in the same context in which they learn the material. So how does this relate or what impact does this have on how we encourage our students to study? Yeah, this is a really interesting one because um, Going back to your brilliant book again, Patrice, there's so much in there. Um, the near and far transfer, you also talk about location. You know, we can do the home testing, homework, home study, the classroom. I guess for teachers, the challenge is you're fixed to a particular space in a building and you can't necessarily take your students elsewhere other than a library or outside or to the IT suite. So you can you can quiz students in another scenario. I guess when we do practice for exams sometimes schools will close the hall and put all the students in for a, a kind of mock exam and that's where they can rehearse this scenario my tip i suppose was i rem uh, over the easter holidays just gone my son was revising for his standard attainment tests here in england uh, he is in year six ten years old and he was revising for his stats you know we hadn't pushed him at all and he was revising at the end of the day and left it to last minute. And I just said to him, context dependent memory. I didn't say that to him. <laughs> I, said, I said, Freddie, you're going to be tested first thing in the morning. So why don't you practice your rehearsal and your retrieval at the same time? And it was interesting. It was a bit of a light bulb moment for him, really. He then, for the rest of the Easter break, got up in the morning before he enjoyed the, his day. He did his practice, whether it was for three minutes or 15 and I think there's an important lesson for us all there, where possible, design that test scenario in the same circumstance. So, you know, you get a lot of students say, Miss, can I put my headphones on? I promise I'll behave. Well, my answer would be no, because you won't retrieve in that context where you've got lyrics blasting in your ears and so on and so forth. So it's an interesting piece of research. Uh, obviously can unpick it in greater depth elsewhere, but um, it's something for us to consider in terms of when we want to quiz kids or practice for a formal test, the need to practice in the same scenario, they'll, they'll sadly be used in a high stakes scenario. That is, that's really good information. And then I had a question about um, in chapter four, again, you were talking about the reward loop. Yes. So, how do you think that a positive feedback impacts retrieval? That is a really good question because how you frame it, um, you know, a lot of, you know, so I've already shared some of the feedback types. I shouldn't really say feedback because there are assessment types. Um, 
but not many people factor in the influences. Uh, one that English schools in particular do factor in on their teaching and learning policies is time. So we know feedback has to be manageable. So if I've got 30 students, I need to be able to either do it physically on a, in a book or around the classroom. It needs to motivate the student and mean something for them to act on my feedback there or when I'm gone. And most schools will talk about time, but we don't go beyond that in terms of uh, competition, uh, specific, general, positive, negative. So there are so many other influences that can impact on the quality of feedback as well as the response from the student. I, I think another thing to consider is viewing the feedback to improve the student, not just the piece of work. And I think once we understand a little bit more about the reward loop, so that you'll most some of us should be familiar with the word dopamine. So if I put out a tweet and I get 17,000 likes, I'll think, right, I'm going to go and put that tweet out again because I'm going to get 17,000 likes again. The reality is it's not the case. You know, without getting distracted about the social media conversation for us all and mental health, you can see how the dopamine effect impacts on us all on a, in a virtual book launch with nice comments to a tweet, to a book review on Amazon uh, and whatever else, how that really rewards us in the future and changes our behaviors. Thank you. Great. So um, I'm conscious everyone's watching and we're having a little conversation. <laughs> that was the plan. Um, but uh, I've got a lot of questions. So I'm conscious it's five past eight. I'm going to whiz through the next two or three chapters and then Patrice will pose another question or two to me and then keep your questions coming. I will promise I will go through them all. And if you have to disappear, um, then you've got the recording to come back to and you should see the comments that I'll publish uh, online uh, in, in this, on the screen or in the chat box also. So let's move on to chapter five. So chapter five, everybody, cognitive load theory. So a lot of people here in the UK are familiar with this term. Um, uh, what I what I learned from unpicking, you know, what the, the, pu the published paper said, the original document, how it's been applied in particular context and how it's been translated elsewhere. It's not a theory for everything, but it's an interesting theory about how we might learn and, and how it might change your approach to teaching. Um, so what I've got in here is just a simple graphic which explains some of the terminology. There was another phrase called germane load, G-E-R-M-A-N-E, -E, um, but they kind of largely amalgamated into extraneous. I guess the difference here is intrinsic load is the material being studied. So this topic is hard. There, That's intrinsic loads too high. And many of you might be suffering already from cognitive load because of the complexity of the topic. Where the book comes in, or I, is extraneous load. I can reduce it or make it worse by the way I deliver the information or by the way I teach or the task I select to help you solve the problem. And it's just a really interesting concept. So there's a lot more in the book, but that's without going into too much detail because I could go on for hours just about this chapter itself. But that would be just that book in essence without going through the resources. Mental models, chapter six is the mnemonics. So the visual representations or the kind of vocabulary and terminology. So I've got a couple of ones you'll be familiar with. We can, well, I, I assume we can all, but sometimes we forget, you know, what are, the colors of the rainbow and if you put your knuckles together you can work out which days of the month so if you look at them face forward um january february march you can work out if one month has got more days than the other i really like that physical mnemonic to retrieve the days of the month but there are many others and i've quoted a few in the book but then the use of mnemonics to tell stories so i i've got a car here for you uh, and I've got 50 million pounds or half a million pound, I say 50 million would, would maybe get as a Formula One car. Um, but I say to you, so let's imagine the car. Let's smell the interior. What does it look like? We can start to visualize and start to tell a story 
Or I might ask you about your first car you ever owned, and you should, using your uh, episodic memory, which is your personal life, describe the colour of your car. But semantic memory, tell me the number plate registration of your car. You might have forgotten that information unless you took time to practice. So this, this chapter is about mnemonics and storytelling. And I guess part of my life, public speaking, and Patrice will know this also, you, you develop a particular script or a particular method for sharing bite-sized information, making it resonate with people, uh, memorable, etc. And that, that's all very useful for teachers. The chapter seven, and I'll pause again. It, this this chapter is all about brain plasticity, so how it's shaped, how it grows. I guess for people here in the UK and, and probably people watching elsewhere, um, I managed to connect with Professor Sarah Jane Blakemore, who's one of the world leading neuroscientists on the teenage brain. And she's got fabulous research on what happens to our young people at school and why they have so, such extreme emotions and, and unusual responses to everyday scenarios. And it's because their brain's going through rapid neural growth, and it's not their fault. So we probably should be a little bit more sympathetic. So I found that really interesting. And her book, Inventing Ourselves, I would strongly recommend you have a, a read or a listen on Audible for that one. So that really informed me for this part. But Blending into Cognitive Apprenticeship, which is the next chapter of the book. Just talking about novice to expert. If you look at the graphic here, you've got a baby learning to walk or learning to crawl to begin with before they can kind of wobble along and take their first steps to a point where we can walk up a mountain and use um, what are the kind of walking sticks to, to help with our balance when we're a bit more of an expert. Uh, I guess the message here is when you're new to a problem, you work backwards from the solution in stages. When you are an expert, so make me a cup of tea, you've done it thousands of times, you can work straight ahead. And you then get clever and nuanced and you say, strong tea, weak tea, milk first, milk second, one sugar, two sugars. And you start to add all your experience. So there's an example of a maths equation. Uh, which one are you? Are you a novice, an intermediate, or are you an expert? So um, the last slide, and I'll pause, you know, just unpicking cognitive load a little bit. So that novice, that would be difficult if I sh if you show me the end goal without breaking it down. The recommendation to manage cognition is show me the end, but let's work in chunks, worked examples. Here's one I made earlier. I model the process, et cetera. Uh, and that spider web analogy. So we talked about the wardrobe men metaphor. I guess with curriculum design and developing knowledge, my scheme is not yet established. So that broken spider web, once it's developed and enhanced, each of the connections strengthen one another. And I, I like that analogy also. So there's lots, but um, I'll just pause for another break, Patrice. And people watching, thank you for still staying tuned. Ping some questions over and some comments, and I'm, I am going to respond to them all. I'm going to skim them while Patrice poses me a question. Well, I've got two questions for you, Ross. The first one, so in all this work that you've done, what has cognitive science taught you? And the second question, what advice do you have for teachers working in different sectors? So the first one, again, what, in a nutshell, what has cognitive science taught you? Okay, and then what can teachers do? Um, gosh, I guess more than anything, it's taught me that there's a lot of good evidence out there to back up, I guess, our hunches. And a lot of teachers that aren't going back to that phrase of the art of teaching and the science of teaching, it's kind of marrying them both together and not saying it's either or, it's art versus, it's together. And, I, you know, for me now, 30 years, I relied on the art and that experience rather than the science. And I guess getting the science gives you a bit more of a stronger position. I guess what I'm learning more about the study skills and the processing and decoding information, 
there are conscious decisions that I do as a teacher that make a big difference to retention. What teachers can do in their own context, and as a broad rule of thumb, being aware of three to nine pieces of information that you can manipulate and that you forgot what I said 30 seconds ago, if you're working with a child who's four years old, their paying attention span is going to be very narrow and very short. It's a bit like when their bones are growing and their, their dexterity is limited compared to uh, someone who's fully grown. Um, if you're a, a more exper uh, an older student, 16, 18 years old, your cognitive load's a bit broader. You might be able to manage uh, kind of paying attention chunks in 15 to 20 minute chunks. And I guess what I've learned is and um, particularly through the kind of online era such as doing this uh, session online is that even us as educators and i know now we've been on this session i'm just checking the clock one hour and 15 minutes i'm going to lose you after 10 or 15 minutes so the retrieval practice the book prizes the qr codes just like you do in the classroom here's one i made earlier what do you think uh, and that's why the Zoom era has been a particular challenge for all teachers is managing that load online. So there's there's lots of lessons, but those are my key takeaways. Short, manageable chunks with lots of regular breaks, time to process. I know already my uh, head is starting to brew, not a small headache, but I need to pause, rest, etc. because it's intense. It's intense information. And when you're delivering a lesson or a keynote speech, or even a full day training in front of 200 teachers, your own cognitive load starts to suffer. So you have to model the learning process for other educators, and educators have to do that with pet for parents and for our young people. Um, so I, ho I hope that answered both those questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to finish off the last couple of ideas, and then we'll go through all your questions. The cognitive apprenticeship. This is where teachers have told me they struggle the most, but I think it's easily accessible. I think more than cognitive load theory, personally. And it's that novice and expert. So I guess the, the best analogy I can give you is think of a cup of tea. I want you to make a cup of tea for me, please. Traditionally, in classrooms, the teacher would model the process Here's the resources you need, so scaffolds, take what you want, or you need to use this first, this second. As you become an expert, I fade the resources away to develop your metacognitive thinking. And along the process, I coach you, depending on the critique I give you, the questions I pose, and where you are in the process. And of course, I'll involve other resources, other learners as part of that process. This is what's called traditional apprenticeship. And this is typically the model for all good classrooms around the world. The, the, the cognitive apprenticeship suggests tweak it slightly and use this process, which is, I'm just, I'm just realizing I haven't shared the slides. <laughs> uh, that is a silly cognitive load error. There's, there's that slide. The, um, the model, scaffold, fade and coach methodology. And then instead of doing this, what, what's traditional, the model, scaffold, fade and coach as a teaching and learning process or a loop in the classroom is do this instead. So this is the cognitive apprenticeship. Here's the process. Rather than me say to make a good table, you need to measure accurately. I need to chunk it, be explicit, show some examples, and then situate this maybe an abstract task into a real-life scenario and then diversify the options, whether we make it a competition or someone comes into the class and say, here's a problem I've got, let's go and visit the venue. Um, can you tell I'm a DT teacher? Uh, and then uh, we, we start to unpick and transfer what students have learnt. I won't go through this slide in great detail, in fact, not at all, because we're just conscious of time, but it's broken down into all this kind of information in terms of the content, the method, the sequence that teachers should recommend to use. And then the sociological factors are all the kind of external things that happen in and outside the classroom, including community, to, to take that teaching loop a little bit further. 
So it, on the surface, it looks complicated, but I don't think it is really. And I hope that chapter in particular just breaks down at least what the data is telling me. People are a little bit fearful of this topic. I'll do one more. Uh, the well-being and memory. I think this is the most important chapter. It will back up what most of us know about exercise, sleep, and diet. And I guess what I wanted to do in particular was unpick, give me the research on well-being, some new research, some established research, and its connections with good exam scores, good attendance, good behavior, what, however you want to define it. And then how we can, at least at a policy level and strategy in our schools and colleges, create more fulfilling approaches to teaching and learning in our classrooms for our young people. You know, pandemic and mental health is on the rise. So how do we manage that better? So kind of raising the profile of these things in our schools, not just something that's done at home in particular. So there's tons in the book, but I guess there's loads of resources. But, you know, looking at the penile gland and, uh, you know, we're talking about the reptilian brain, the fight or flight scenario, the recommendations on sleep depend on your age. I don't know about you, Patrice, but when I don't have a good night's sleep, I will, I'm never a better teacher in the morning. I will <laughs> suffer dramatically, and I suspect we all do. And there is an enormous body of research. I've just picked out some of my favorites, you know, about why it, is it part where you're watching is sleep, diet, exercise, part of your education policy. Um, when you have poor sleep, it impairs your cognitive ability and declines over time if, you, if that's regular. So think about your vulnerable students. Do we know how, how what a good night's sleep they have or not? And do they have that safe space? Um, you know, how it, uh, the, it, it creates extra stress. And then typically your disadvantaged kids have lower sleep, sleep quality. My favorite research is, um, and I haven't quoted the reference here, but it is in the book, that taking naps boosts your memory recall now the challenge for teachers we can't let kids fall asleep but we can build in mindfulness moments or a quick pause the lesson retrieve think pair share 30 seconds stand up you know when you stand up your neurons suddenly change try it patrice i'm going to get you to stand up because you've been sitting down for an hour Come on, patrice. <laughs> um I'm, I'm i'm kind of uh stuck at my desk here ross kind of so, you know, when you stand up, move around, all these little things, they really just change the dynamics. Uh, but the interesting bit on sleep, it, it allows your uh, brain to recover uh, information. So, so there's tons in there. But again, trying to do all this in a, a short kind of book launch session is, is quite a challenge. The last chapter, Patrice, and then you can fire a few more questions at me, is... What can you do with all the information back at your, your own kind of school setting or for yourself? Teachers already on the data have told me they don't have enough time and access to this research or materials is expensive. I've told you already, if you do the survey, and I'll put the link back on the screen once we finish, you can get my book for half price. Um, it's how to translate it all back and share them. I think I've worked now with 100,000 teachers face-to-face -face in the last five years and doing teacher training my whole career as a school leader for a good 17 years. Um, I've, I've seen all models of teacher training and trying to work out how you can translate all this complex theory into a kind of step-by-step -step guide. So just some screenshots from this particular chapter. You've got a five-minute CPD plan in my book, but then you've got a bit of research in terms of how do you critique as a teacher different types of research and, and implement effective professional development for your team or across your entire institution? How you translate my research into your own setting if you work with primary students or high school students? And then just looking at the research on all the different areas, things to consider. You know, when you do it all the time, it becomes easier. But if you've never spoken publicly in front of your colleagues, that's quite a scary thing to do. Uh, and once you do it thousands of times, it becomes automated. So what I've done in this section of the book is come up with a methodology or a thinking process that I go through when I'm planning a teacher training event 
in a, a school or a keynote or whatever it might be. So it's kind of walk through chapter uh, with a few bits of research on what effective CPD looks like. So there's the last three, ch uh, two or three chapters. Patrice, um, fire some questions. Well, let me start with a comment. Um, when I am presenting to teachers and giving professional development, a question that I always encourage teachers to ask is, when, when they're presented with new information, ask, on what evidence is this based? Mm -hmm. Because too often we have been we have been led through anecdotes and fads on what evidence is this based? And your book, Ross, is filled with evidence. So I think, you know, when you want to have a guide right there that helps you understand memory and how it works, it's based on evidence and that's important. And mm -hmm. I, I think another comment is, and I talk about this a lot with powerful teaching. Once we learn the basics of how we learn, how our memory works, another phrase I really like to use with teachers is you do you. There's no one script that will work for every teacher every bit of the time. You do you. You know your curriculum. You know your students. <laughs> you know your administration, you know your community, and being able to take, it's important that we understand the background and then how can we take what we now know and utilize it to best help our students. And powerful teaching, guide to memory, the information is out there, it's, it's in our hands. And now it's time for you to do you. I love that phrase, you do you. Um, I'm going through the comments also, Patrice. Um, so people recommending your book. Um, I've got loads of kind of comments from people who are responding in the chat box to the quiz we had earlier. Uh, we've got a question here from Victoria. Does children's ability to create long-term memory change as they develop? Um, it's a good question. I My, uh, my gut would say yes. Uh, the research is clear um, that it does. So again, how that's supported through school, through home, through policy uh, is what's what, what's important here. I guess there are things we can do as a teacher. Um, I don't know what age group you teach, Victoria. I'll try and skim the chat box as we go through, but I can see in this comment you said here that you're a head of year. Um, and I think the chapter on well-being, memory and exercise uh, that pastoral aspect of the curriculum is essential for people like you in your role to make a big influence. Um, got a nice comment here from Steve. Uh, Patrice, really informative. Thank you both. Um, so thank you for taking part. I'll take a few more questions. Um, let me just finish with a couple of QR codes, everybody. And I knew I would go well over time. Um, the This one here is just some questions from me, I suppose. Uh, and there's tons more in the book. I love posing lots of questions for people to think as they read through. Um, you know, how can you share this with families? How is it going to change the way you teach? What do they know about study techniques? Does it start from day one of school or does it only start um, when they are um, doing their exams? And the other resource I've got for you here. Let me just hide that banner here. There we go. Um, so this QR code on the right, if you come, that'll take you to my website. I'll sign a copy for you. You've got the publisher in the middle, uh, and they do have one or two little branded goodies, but you love to ask them. And these things are out of my control as an author. Patricia will know that. <laughs> but if you want to um, get something delivered to you tomorrow, but in, at risk of uh, contributing to climate change and packaging and all sorts of things, you've got that uh, supplier begin with A on the left-hand side who always over-package anything. I don't know what you think, Patrice, but I think they package things far too much than they need to. I guess they need to protect their products. But um, anyway, you make that decision, everybody. I've got one more freebie for you, I suppose, and I'll go back to the survey is this QR code here, if you want to scan that, 
I've it's not on Audible, but I've recorded the introduction to the book uh, off piste ad hoc, and I've had a laugh here or there inside and made one or two boo boos. But you can hear me talk about the start of the book. It's actually very hard to read out aloud the book, and I've actually done it <laughs> once, and it's really difficult. Um, but you can hear me talk about the introduction. So if you're not sure about getting the book, uh, this this might whet your appetite. Um, I'll come out the slides, and I'm just going to leave that QR code uh, for the survey. There it is there. And I guess I'm going to kind of start to say I uh, close things formally. But, Patrice, you got anything else you want to pose my way? Uh, just I think you've covered so many things. If you want to just maybe one more, what do you think is the next step for a teacher to take? Other than buy your book, of course. Yeah, well, of course. I mean, I mean, there are lots of things already available online on my site, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I guess, you know, I will, well, you know, scan the QR code. So watch back the video, scan the QR code, and listen to the audible introduction where I go through it in a little bit more detail. But you've obviously had this session where you've heard me kind of allude to what's inside the book. For me, it's it's squeezing fifteen years particularly last three years in greater detail, into one place. It's my journey. You will have to go on your journey at some point in your life, and maybe you've already started it, or maybe I'm just the kind of beginning for you. Uh, and then it's what you do next. And as Patrice said, you do you. So you need to decide uh, what, what you need to do next in your own life and in your own professional working life. Um, so I, I guess that would be my my recommendations. There's tons of stuff already freely available on my site about all the things that I've been reading and writing about. And that's just helped me bring it all together in one, one place. Apologies, my phone's going off here. And uh, put it in a place where it's nice, a, a nice meaty book. What I love about the books now is when I'm in schools, I can give copies of the books to teachers. Uh, so after I've gone, they've got something impactful to use uh, longer term. Um, so uh, I guess that would be my my top tip. So I'm going to take that off the screen, uh, Patrice, and um, kind of bring things formally to a close. But I'll just um, put one or two questions and comments uh, on the screen. So I know Ruth has already got a copy of my book, uh, and she's already started reading it. And Debbie, who's got a copy of my Revision Revolution with Helen Howe, uh, so she's already dipping into the study skills. So you'll see some familiar themes in this book. Um, book arrived today. So Trace is already busy. Uh, and we've got that nice compliment there from RM uh, about what Patrice said. It's a great phrase, Patrice. You got any more words of wisdom? So many, but we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone, for your comments. Um, the video is on here. Um, I um, will contact everyone as usual through Eventbrite and I'll put stuff on my site where you can access the resources and stuff. But uh, there it is one more time. Uh, let me just ping it up there. So that's the QR for the survey. So please take part. It'd be nice to uh, build up a large database. I'll blog this and then we can all use it to inform our practice back in schools. Um, all your usual places, so I won't plug them again. But thank you for signing up. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for watching this uh, later if you missed the live session. Um, and I, I guess I just want to say to Patrice, you know, thank you for joining me and uh, giving me some inspiration and sharing some words of wisdom and taking time out of your busy schedule because I know you're all over the place. It has been such a joy, Ross, to be a part of this process. And what I really love is like, We've had this joining of minds across the pond, and it's yes. it's it's wonderful to um to work with you and and thank you everyone for joining. Um, and, um, Patrice, you're at um, research ed and in America soon, aren't you? So what was the date? October the twenty second. Oh yes, research ed Frederick. Uh, real quick, I got to speak at research ed Surrey in this past October. I loved England. Um, so come on over, come to my country, yeah, uh, October 22nd in Frederick, Maryland.
So there you can hear uh, Patrice. And P are you with Pooja as well, Patrice? Yes. Dr. Agarwal right. and I are the keynote speakers. Yeah, I, I thoroughly recommend it. So I'm looking at all your comments. Thank you, everyone. I'll respond to them in good time. But I'm going to kind of end the recording formally. Um, so stay on the, the line, Patrice. But um, thank you, everybody, for joining me. Thanks for your interest. And if you do get a copy of the book, I know it will make a difference. The, the question is, you know, as Patrice said, you do you. What are you going to do next? And how are you going to share this with your colleagues, your pupils, your families to make the, the kind of classroom an, an easier space to manage? And ultimately, for me, I think that kind of social justice issue to help some of our vulnerable children out there. Um, so that's it. Um, guide to memory. Uh, there you go. It's a nice bite sized thinner book this time. So it should be quicker. I think you can read it in about a day and a half. <laughs> so I don't know about you, but I'm, I've managed to proofread it three times in, in uh, about a day each. Um, so anyway, I'm rambling. I'm going to stop. Uh, bye, everybody. Uh, and I'll see you again. Thank you.